This morning we will be talking about cessationism. That's a large word with a bunch of syllables. Um, Conversation at the dinner table last night, no, this is not sensationalism. Uh, and, And we're not talking about secessionism either a a new civil war or a Texas independence or anything like that. Uh, We are talking about the theological concept of cessationism. And cessationism is simply a belief that something stops. Cessationism just means you believe that something ceases. And in the theological realm, when we're talking about cessationism, we're talking about particularly the cessation of spiritual gifts. So the question we seek to answer this morning uh, is simply this. Should we expect the sign miracles or the revelatory miracles that we find on the pages of the New Testament to be normal or to continue? Should we expect that what happened in Acts 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people speaking languages they never studied, that that should be the norm for our day? Or should we expect that miracles like Peter waving a handkerchief over someone who is lame and instantly he would be healed or Paul raising the dead, are these the kinds of things that we should expect to see in the church today? And if so, has the church lost her power? If these things have been lost over the course of church history, should they be revived? Should they be restored? Are these the frontline signs for the outworking of the progress of the gospel? Should these be the hallmarks of our church experience? Now, if you have been around charismatic theology, maybe by way of show of hands, and we are filming you right now, so we're going to scan the camera to see who this is. Uh, How many of you have been in charismatic circles, either in a charismatic church, have spoken in tongues, have experienced miraculous uh, events and happenings as the norm in church experience? I have. Uh, That's part of my own personal background and testimony of of God's kindness to me in my life. I was in churches where truth was taught and Jesus was extolled and the belief was held that these miraculous things we see in the page of the New Testament are to be normal experiences in the church. I had good times in in those experiences, uh, but I'm not there now. And so we wanna talk about what is this issue of cessationism? Uh, Have the gifts ceased? So we'll, we'll talk about some uh, definitions of cessationism. Next slide. Um, there are several versions of views on this. Uh, first of all, uh, total cessationism is the idea that the operation of all spiritual gifts have ceased. And some scholars hold to total cessationism. That is, when you read the list of the spiritual gifts uh, in Romans or in 1 Corinthians or in 1 Peter, Um, that every single one of those was designed for the first century church as foundational, and they have all gone off the scene. Uh, That that is total cessationism. A second view is partial cessationism. And partial cessationism is the view that the revelatory sign gifts have disappeared, that, that they have gone along with their purpose for existing in the church, but other gifts remain. Uh, Other gifts besides the revelatory gifts or the sign miracles, those remain for the benefit of the church. Uh, A third view is the continuationist view. This is the view of the third wave or charismatic or Pentecostal churches that one should expect manifestations of the Spirit's power, the same ones evident in the first generation of the church, that they would be normal for today. The miraculous healings, tongues speaking, and other phenomena seen for the last century in Pentecostalism, or the charismatic movement, or the third wave movements, that those are the manifestations of the Holy Spirit's dispensing of miraculous gifts. In other words, the continuationist view holds that what has happened in the 20th century in the charismatic movement is what the New Testament describes. It is a continuation, or perhaps a revival of those things. A fourth view is a middle road view. Uh, Some have termed this open but cautious. It's a hesitation about modern day charismatic phenomenon that don't seem to fit the New Testament picture and practice of spiritual gifts, but they say neither does the New Testament seem to teach clearly that the miraculous gifts have ceased. Uh, 
Therefore, the best approach is to be open to the possibility that the Holy Spirit could dispense miraculous gifts today, to be practiced in the manner and for the purposes for which they were given in the New Testament. So the open but cautious view might be the predominant view in our circles. I don't know how you would define your theological circle. Uh, but those who preach the gospel, those who believe the Bible to be true, and, and those perhaps who don't want to put God in a box. That would be the open but cautious view. If you're wondering what Grace Bible Church holds, the next slide gives the answer. <laughs> we would be partial cessationists. We would be partial cessationists. That is view two. We believe that the revelatory and sign gifts have ceased along with their purpose for existing... And we believe that the other gifts necessary for the function of the church dispensed by the Holy Spirit, by his sovereign placement, continue. That would be partial cessationism. Now let me just say for a few moments what cessationism is not. Okay, sometimes cessationism gets branded with some unhelpful descriptions. Uh, Cessationism does not mean that there is no Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit is dead, or that the Holy Spirit was for another age. No, we absolutely, desperately cling to the truth of the person and work of the Holy Spirit, not only as a historical figure, but as the person of the Trinity who dwells in every single believer, who inhabits the church collectively, and who gifts and empowers the church for its basic functions. We are desperately dependent on the person and work of the Holy Spirit as believers. Cessationism does not mean we don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Cessationism also does not mean we don't believe in miracles. A miracle would be the uh, overreaching of God above and beyond what is normally experienced in the natural world. In his normal providence, a, a miracle would be God doing something extraordinary beyond the normal means of providence, according to natural laws. We believe God does miracles. We believe God can do miracles. We believe God will do miracles. He can intervene. He can superimpose his will over and against that which would naturally happen, which happens according to all the natural laws that are in his hand anyway. Uh, There is significant overlap between the ordinary and the extraordinary that I think we miss sometimes. God's normal, ordinary procedures through the things he has set up to run the universe are by themselves extraordinary, yet we allow for the miraculous, that which goes beyond. Cessationism does not mean God is dead. (laughs) Cessationism does not mean there is no providence, that God is not meticulously sovereign over all the details of human life, providing guidance as a man plans his steps so the Lord directs his path. Uh, superintending circumstances and uh, thoughts and intentions of man and even working out the plans of kings like channels of water in his own hand. God is intimately connected to his universe. He's not some watchmaker off in the distance that set the watch going and just let it go in some mechanical fashion. No, his meticulous sovereignty means he is here and he is involved Cessationism does not mean that there will be no future revelation from God. In fact, as we will see, cessationism actually means we have the fullness of complete revelation from God for us at this time in his word. But in the future, God will reveal himself again. There will be prophecies again. There will be visions again. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will have visions. There will be two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 who will give direct revelation to a watching world. Jesus Christ himself will come in person. He is the word of God. He is the revelation of God. God will manifest himself in supernatural, unmistakable, and new revelatory ways in the future. Cessationism does not mean God will never speak again. It means that God has sufficiently spoken to us, for us, in his word, and there are future things coming. And then finally, cessationism is not stale, stodgy, lifeless, intellectual Christianity. Just sort of non-emotional, spiritless, blasé, bland. Those are some of the labels that get thrown onto cessationism as a theological construct, and that's tragic. I believe some of that is the the result of the elevation of emotionalism 
and of subjective impressions and the idea that to have a real relationship means a back and forth between me and God. Uh, God's, I don't have to open my Bible, God's gonna tell me stuff apart from my Bible. That feels real and it feels relational. Uh, but there are significant problems with that view. So to restate, what do we believe about the gifts? We believe that revelatory sign gifts, which were foundational to the church, ceased in the first century by God's design as the fullness of God's revelation and regulation for the church age was published. As cessationists, we believe that God has given us in his sufficient word all that we need to know to know him, to have eternal life, to discern his will for our lives. We're not looking for more revelation from God at this time. Additionally, we believe that God gave to the church what the church needed in its infancy when it did not have the publication of God's complete word. Before the immature church had access to the New Testament, it, it wasn't yet written or distributed, and God was kind to the first generation of the church, the foundation layer of the church, by actually revealing his mind and heart about how the church was to function, how Christians should live their lives in light of the first coming of Christ, his death, burial, and his resurrection, and a new age. The foundational or revelation, uh, the foundation of revelation from God through the apostles through the New Testament prophets and through the revelatory spiritual gifts was essential for the church's foundation and growth. So the same principle holds, truth, holds true for both eras. In the first generation, God saw fit to give his people what they needed to be pleasing to him. And as God has seen fit to publish his word, he has given us in our day what we need sufficiently to be pleasing to him. The same plan in God as his revelation was unfolded. So we could make a case for cessationism by the definitions of spiritual gifts. If we were to walk through the lists of spiritual gifts and define them from the New Testament, some of them just get named and not described. That's curious. Uh, they get named, but not a long list of instruction about how to use them. That's curious if those were to be normative. Uh, but a lot of them are given a context in which we can understand what they were or perhaps what they are. And if we compare and contrast the New Testament definitions and descriptions of those spiritual gifts, compare and contrast them with the operation of so-called spiritual gifts in the charismatic world today, I think we would find significant differences. So we could make a case for cessationism on the bare definitions of what those spiritual gifts are. For instance, tongues in the New Testament, Acts 2, and then all the way through every use in the New Testament, tongues, the gift of tongues, was the supernatural ability to speak known, understandable human languages that you had never studied. So you can speak Spanish without ever having cracked a book or known a Spanish speaker. And, and what was the purpose of that? I would, the direct, I would direct you to Scott Maxwell's series on tongues as a sign against unrepentant Israel. It's a several part series detailing what the purpose of tongues was in the first century, significantly as a judgment against Israel for having rejected Messiah that Gentile nations would speak in their midst. According to the Old Testament, it was a reference to the times of the Gentiles where the Jews would be under the thumb of foreign speakers. But significantly in Acts chapter two, here you have dispersed Jews and god fearers assembling at a Jewish feast in Jerusalem, all speaking languages of foreign tongues they themselves never studied. And all those gathered, hearing the word of God proclaimed in their own languages. This was a remarkable sign, number one, that Israel had failed at her mission, that Messiah had come, and that God was judging the nation for her rejection of Christ. The unfolding of these things is significant. But the gift of tongues as defined in the New Testament, a known, understandable human language that one did not study but was able supernaturally to speak, now this could be done at will. And in the Corinthian church, the Corinthian believers were practicing this gift, although not very well. This is radically different from the gift of tongues as we've known it in the 20th century. 
uh, unknowable uh, languages. They're not languages, but a collection of syllables spoken together in a row that is untranslatable, unknowable. In, in fact, the, the first modern instances of tongue speaking uh, came out of the Irvingite movement in England. Edward Irving was a, a pastor who sought for the revival of these phenomenon in the 1820s, 1830s. And uh, they, they prayed, the, the group of Irvingites prayed for this, and then eventually uh, they started speaking in this ecstatic utterance. Uh, a collection of syllables run together. And their assumption was that they were supernaturally speaking Asian languages. And a number of them actually saved up money, packed up their bags, and moved to China, assuming that they supernaturally could speak Chinese and preach the gospel to Chinese hearers without ever having to study Chinese that this would be given as a supernatural revelation. They were gravely disappointed. They came back to Europe with their tails between their legs and realized we weren't speaking Chinese at all. And they redefined tongues at that point to describe a heavenly language rather than a known earthly human language. That is a change in the definition. And, and you could walk through the spiritual gifts and compare and contrast the New Testament description of those gifts with the 20th century redefinition of those gifts and find them at discord. Just at a definitional level, you would begin to make a case for whatever was going on in the New Testament stopped because this ain't that. We could make a case for cessationism from history, a historical case for cessationism. That is that for centuries after the first century, the, the church needed explanations for why these things stopped. In the third and fourth centuries, pastors were writing letters to churches explaining why they were not experiencing what they were reading in Acts 2. What they, why they were not experiencing what they were reading about in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, 13, and 14. Where are those things, the churches said. And their pastors wrote to them explaining they have gone off the scene. That is significant historical testimony to the fact that they did cease. Right? That's, a, that's a historical case for cessationism. Th these miraculous gifts did actually stop in church history. And I'll give you just a few quotes. John Chrysostom, and by the way, Nate Busnitz has done a marvelous job of assembling these quotes from the early church fathers and from church history. John Chrysostom in the fourth century, 344 to 407. He says, 1 Corinthians 12 is very obscure, but the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to and by their cessation, being such as then used to occur, but no longer take place. That's John Chrysostom, golden mouth, uh, in the fourth century. Augustine wrote in uh, the early fourth century, in the earliest times, or sorry, late fourth century, early fifth century, in the earliest times, the Holy Spirit fell upon them that believe, and they spoke with tongues, which they had not learned, as the Spirit gave them utterance. These were signs adapted to the time, for this was the betokening of the Holy Spirit in tongues or languages to show the gospel of God was to run through all tongues over the whole earth. It was done for a sign and it passed away. Theodoret of Cyrus, early fifth century, he wrote, some spoke in tongues which they did not know and which nobody had taught them, while others performed miracles or prophesied. The Corinthians also did these things, but they did not use the gifts as they should have done. They were more interested in showing off than in using them for the edification of the church. Martin Luther, similarly, in the 1500s, the visible outpouring of the Holy Spirit was necessary to the establishment of the early church, as were the miracles that accompanied the gift of the Holy Ghost. Once the church had been established and properly advertised by these miracles, the visible appearance of the Holy Ghost ceased. And John Calvin, writing in the 1500s, the gift of healing, like the rest of the miracles, which the Lord willed to be brought forth for a time, has vanished away in order to make the preaching of the gospel marvelous forever. And on and on and on. I'll skip the, skip the rest. You get the idea. The pastors through church history were explaining, not did they cease, but everybody knew they did. Let me explain to you why. We could mark an experiential case for cessationism. Um, 
That is, if you've been involved with charismatic phenomenon uh, and, and had your own experiences, you might say, well, I'm not sure this lines up with the New Testament. If, for instance, the directions for speaking in tongues to the church at Corinth said, uh, one at a time, and it must be translated. What good is speaking French if nobody understands French? If this is direct revelation from the Lord, everybody should benefit from it. These are for the edification of the church. Additionally, they are a sign to unbelievers, back to the purpose of tongues related to Israel. If we're not exercising them according to the instructions, we're doing something wrong. And so your experience might lead you to believe, huh, I don't know that what I'm doing here in the 20th century is what was done in the first. Something is amiss. And then you might associate the, the theological error, um, the bad behavior that happens many times in uh, the charismatic environments and realize that something is not right. In my own personal experience, and this is merely anecdotal, I recognize, uh, the, the friends that I had who were all speaking in tongues uh, when I was in that charismatic experience, they weren't walking with Christ. They had this experience when they came to a gathering and, and it was like getting gas at the gas station. It fueled them up experientially to go through the week. But when they went through the week, they, they didn't represent Christ at school. Uh, they, they weren't experiencing the transformation of life that came with confession and repentance They didn't know their Bibles, and eventually they all walked away from a profession of Christ altogether. Now now that's experiential, that's that's my experience, And, 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 and that caused me to wonder, were those experiences the experiences of the New Testament? But what I wanna do this morning is build for you an exegetical case for cessationism. That's where we'll spend the bulk of our time, an exegetical case for cessationism. And and we'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to do so. And I believe a case for cessationism can be made from other passages than 1 Corinthians 13. You could, for instance, observe the New Testament dying off of miracles at will, right? We, We said earlier that God still does miracles today, but the ability of a miracle worker who at will has the supernatural gift of healing, has gone off the scenes. In fact, you can observe that in the New Testament. It went off the scenes in the apostles' time period. Do you remember Peter waving a handkerchief or or Paul raising Eutychus from the dead? Uh, These kinds of things were happening early on in the apostolic ministry, but but later on you read things like 2 Timothy 4.20 where Paul says, Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. Wait, if if he was so essential to gospel progress, Paul, why didn't you just heal him? You healed so many others earlier. And then you get what Paul writes to Timothy Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. Timothy, take a little wine for your frequent stomach ailments. He's he's giving him medical advice rather than just healing him. Uh, These things were going off the scene even in the apostles' time period. You could take, for instance, the, the testimony of Hebrews 2, verses three and four. And and there is a past time reference here, looking back on the early apostolic age. There the writer to Hebrews says, if the word spoken through the angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through Jesus, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, with the ones who heard, the first century eyewitnesses, confirming or testifying by signs and wonders and by various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Therefore, we must pay close attention. There the writer to Hebrews is saying already The gifts are in the past tense. The miracles and the signs, they happened and they're over. And so there's a case to be made from various places in scripture. Not to mention Ephesians 2.20 which lists the apostles and the prophets, the New Testament prophets, those who are getting direct revelation from the Lord and then speaking the Lord's truth to God's people. They are the foundation of the church according to Ephesians 2.20. They are that which the successive generations of the church were built. 
and that prophetic testimony that God gave through that office, New Testament prophet, became inscripturated in what we have in the New Testament now. We're, we're reading apostolic doctrine. We just have it in written form. But let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. I think this is uh, the, the place we want to turn to, to make a case here. <clears throat> and we might focus a lot of our discussion on tongues, but, but the principles here speak more broadly to the miraculous gifts and the, 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 those that pointed to the authority of the apostles, as well as all those gifts that brought revelation, that is direct revelation from God. So I want to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians 13.8 and make what is perhaps a shocking statement. Everyone is a cessationist. If you believe your Bible, you are a cessationist. You you have to be a cessationist. Look down at 1 Corinthians 13.8. What does it say? Tongues will what? Cease. Tongues will cease. The Bible says you're a cessationist. Now, the question is when, right? That's the really important question. When will tongues cease? That becomes the, the thing we have to answer, and, and maybe this passage will answer that question. What are some of the options for thinking about when tongues will cease? Uh, one option is sometime in the first century, sometime during the first generation of the church, sometime in the lifetime of the believers that Paul wrote to at Corinth. In other words, the readers of 1 Corinthians 13, 8 would witness the very thing Paul said would happen. That's one option. A second option is the eternal state. Tongues will cease either when you get to heaven or when we all get to heaven or in the new heavens and new earth, sometime in the eschaton, the the end of all things. A third view is that they did cease sometime during or after New Testament times, but they weren't supposed to. The 20th century charismatic movement was a genuine revival of spirituality that should have never been lost. They have now been recovered to the benefit of the church and its gospel witness. The gifts are to be expected, practiced, and maintained until the church age ends. And a fourth view is that they did cease for normal operations of the church, but they may reemerge when there is a revival or when the gospel is making new inroads into unreached places. This is perhaps the argument we hear in our circles sometimes. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't think the charismatic movement is speaking in tongues right, but on the mission field, that's like Acts 2 when the gospel started, it, and it needed proof, it needed miracles, it needed demonstrations so that people will believe the gospel when it's proclaimed, maybe before they get a Bible translation, just like Acts. That's the argument that's often made. And I would suggest to you, if you know anybody who has these gifts, send them to Papua New Guinea. (laughs) That would just make the work a whole lot easier. You often hear the the sort of rumor mill of Christianity. No, I had a friend who had an uncle who told me one time, he knew a missionary that read a book that talked about some biography, a guy who had an uncle that knew somebody once that spoke in a language he never studied. And he did these miracles, and then people believed the gospel, and then church was birthed. And such things have just never been documented, aside from the fact that they go against God's design. There, by the way, there, there is just something incarnational, if I can use that word, about Bible translation. There is a deep love manifested. When you study, study, prepare, study, work, labor, study, prepare, before you go, so that you can go and meet people and love them and learn their worldview, learn their culture, learn their ways, learn the way they think through the vehicle of their own language and then present Christ to them in their mother tongue. Boy, that's hard work. But it resembles something of the distance that God the Son took to cross oceans, atmospheres, to come to us. Don't lose sight of that. Love labor. Look, would we love the shortcut? We're, we're always looking for shortcuts and missions. I know we, we just had two equipping hours on missions, and here we go again. Here's another one. There just aren't good shortcuts. And language learning in church history has been a significant part of the long road of God's growth of the church. <clears throat> 
1 Corinthians 13, 8 says tongues will cease. Uh, let's just see if this passage gives us any clues as to when. Uh, let's read together <clears throat> uh, verses 8 to 13. Love never fails, but if prophecies, they will be done away. If tongues, they will cease. If knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now, faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Consider the context of this passage. The, the context is 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It is gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, love in 1 Corinthians 13, gifts in 1 Corinthians 14. It is a spiritual gift sandwich, and love is the meat. Love's right in the middle. What is Paul doing for the Corinthians? Consider the recipients. Uh, if we take Paul's correctives in 1 Corinthians as an indication of their behavior, and I think that's safe to do, then we would assess the Corinthian church as self-focused, consumed with externals, enamored by what is showy, selfish, they were suing each other even in the secular courts, uh, they were immoral, or tolerant of immorality in the church, and they were severely abusing supernatural gifts with which they had been endowed by the Holy Spirit. We ought not go to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 to see a model church of how gifts are done. The whole thing is a rebuke. The whole thing is a corrective, not an endorsement, not a how-to manual. And what is right smack dab in the middle of this giant three-chapter corrective? Love. I know we think about 1 Corinthians 13 as the, the, the love chapter and what you're supposed to hear at a wedding. It is a fundamental corrective to the abuse of spiritual, of spiritual gifts at the church at Corinth. And then consider the framing of 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 1, notice the, um, I'm sorry, verse 8, notice the first phrase, love never fails. And then notice the last phrase in verse 13, the greatest of these is love. The, the greatest of the three enduring things is love. Consider the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. Verses 1 to 3, you have the mandate of love, right? Um, if you do a bunch of great things, but you don't have love, forget about it. Uh, after the mandate of love in verses 1 to 3, you have the description of love in verses 4 to 7. This is what we hear at, at weddings. This is maybe what you have uh, posted on the hallway uh, between your children's rooms at home. Love does this, does this, does this. It doesn't do this, 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 and this. Kids memorize it. Right, it should be there, it's appropriate. Those are appropriate applications. After the mandate of love in one to three, the description of love in four to seven, you get the endurance of love in eight to 13. That's what the section is about. Love keeps going. Love must keep going. And we have to come to grips, first of all, with the fact that love must endure when tongues cease. That's Paul's point here. Tongues will cease, verse 8. Faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of those is love. What is the point of 8 to 13? Big picture. Love must outlive tongues. That's Paul's point. What is the point of chapter 13? Big picture. In a three-chapter sandwich on the proper employment of spiritual gifts, love is what must drive everything you do. And then what is the point of chapters 12 to 14? Big picture. Corinthians, you're not doing spiritual gifts correctly. You have the ability to show off supernatural powers, but you are failing at love. These transitional, foundational, revelatory sign gifts are going away, and you'd better figure out how to love each other. And I believe indisputably that is the point of this passage. Now, if we dig into the details, will we see anything that will help us understand when revelatory sign gifts will cease? Let me give you some investigative observations. Investigative observations. The first one is in verse 8, and it is a contrast. A contrast. Something is permanent, and some things are temporary. 
Look at verse 8. Love never fails. That's the permanent thing. Then look at all these temporary things. Prophecies, they'll be done away. Tongues, they will cease. Knowledge, it will be done away. And you have here a series of what we call conditional statements. Those are if-then statements. And and you know how an if-then statement works. Um, I'll say something like, if it's sunny out today, we will have a picnic. Right? And, and the first is sort of hypothetical. Um, and, but if the first thing is true, the second thing will be true. The second thing follows. And sometimes the first thing you give is, is nowhere near the truth. If I said, if it snows enough during our morning service, we'll go sledding down Camelback Mountain. <laughs> or I might say something like this. If there's enough time after I get through my notes, you can ask any question you'd like about cessationism. That might be, at this point, far removed from reality, although I intended it as a possibility. Here are conditional statements, and the kind of conditional statements that are given here is the first statement is true. It's stated as a true thing for the sake of the argument. And if the first thing is true, the second thing is absolutely true. It absolutely follows. So what is the if here? And very simply in the original, you you have some added words in your English Bibles, but very simply, if prophecies, they will be done away. Now, were there prophecies in Paul's day in the first century church at the church at Corinth? Was there the gift of New Testament prophetic utterance? God speaks directly to a prophet. The prophet says, thus says the Lord, doesn't mess it up, gets it right, has to say exactly what God says or else he's in a lot of trouble. He is to be tested and examined and God was able through the prophet to speak to the churches. Yes, if prophecies, they will be done away. And the word for done away there is abolished, to to bring to an end. What is the next conditional? If tongues, were there tongues? Yes, there were people supernaturally with the ability to speak human languages that they'd never studied. And they could do it at will. They could turn it on, turn it off. They could be commanded to not do it one at a time. They could be commanded to wait for an interpretation. They had that ability. And if that ability existed, if tongues, they will cease And then the final conditional, if knowledge, it will be abolished. What does Paul mean by knowledge? Everything you ever know will be nuked. No, that's not what he means. Not bare knowledge, like the knowledge of God, which is the fundamental definition of eternal life, John 17, 3. But a word of knowledge, the the supernatural revelatory gift of knowledge. Look back at 2 Corinthians 12, 8. And verse 7 introduces this idea, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That is the the very visible, obvious, supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And then look what he describes, verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, that is, unattainable insight by normal means. Supernaturally given wisdom in the moment, for the moment. And then, to another, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. What is the word of knowledge? That is a revelatory, God-given bit of information you could not get by ordinary means. Knowledge doesn't mean what you could study in a book or what you could memorize from your Bible. It doesn't mean what you could get by asking people some questions. It was supernatural, direct revelation where you knew something you would not otherwise have access to. So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if knowledge, it will be abolished. That's what he's talking about clearly in this context, this supernatural revelatory gift. So there's the contrast. Some, something is permanent, love. Some things are temporary. Verse 9 gives an explanation, an explanation. And the explanation in verse 9 is why some things are temporary. Uh, Why should these things go away? Why why tongues and prophecies and knowledge? Why why are they going to be abolished and why would they cease? Verse 9, because we know in part and we prophesy in part. This little prepositional phrase, in part, it, it just means partial, partially, incompletely. What is Paul saying in verse 9? These things go away because our words of knowledge, they're not everything we need. It's incomplete. It is partial. And, and the prophecy, it's partial. It's incomplete. And, and then we're going to find that 
Um, the word now shows up in verse 12. Um, now we see in a mirror dimly. Now I know in part. There's that partial knowledge again attached with the word now. When you and I read the word now, we read this in 2023. And what does the word now mean? I'm reading it right now. Now's now. What does the word now mean in these verses? It doesn't mean 2023. It means about 55 AD. That's the now. What does now mean in this verse? Back then. <laughs> We're reading this in 2023. For Paul, when he wrote it, the now was now, and now to us, the now is then. That's a tongue twister. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 55 AD on his third missionary journey, according to Acts 19. What did Paul mean when he said that he and the Corinthians only had partial knowledge or incomplete knowledge? Not everything was revealed yet. They didn't have all that God intended to reveal to the church. Think about what had not yet been revealed and understood by the church at Corinth or at any church in 55 AD for that matter. This is the letter, the first letter to the Corinthians. What did the Corinthians not have? You can say it. Second Corinthians. They didn't have it yet. God knew they needed it. Do you know what else they did not have? Galatians, Romans, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Hebrews, Jude, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. And they did not yet have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts. Those were all written subsequent to 1 Corinthians. It's a safe guess that they had the contents of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, which were written from Corinth by Paul on Paul's second missionary journey. So it's conceivable they had that data. And maybe they had a copy of James, which was written perhaps a decade before from Jerusalem. They didn't have much. What did God supply the church at Corinth with? Direct revelation, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, how to live the Christian life, how to do church. The other stuff hadn't been written yet, hadn't been distributed yet. What did they have? Apostles, prophets, direct revelation through foreign languages, but those would be valueless without the interpretation of those tongues. And I think you can see why in comparison to what we have, to, we have the whole Old Testament, the whole New Testament, and scriptured revelation fixed by words in a book. This New Testament revelation lacked the permanence of the book that we have, which is a treasure. It lacked the readability of a book. It lacked the checkability of a book. Somebody says something funny at Corinth. What do you say? Uh, haven't you read Jude? Don't you know what Philippians 3 says about this? There is no Philippians 3. Can I get a word of knowledge? And you were always cross-checking prophets and, and, and posers who would stand up and try to represent God with their words. It's chaos. And without the disciplined rules that 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 gives, the church would have been a mess. Verse 10 gives a second explanation. Not just why those things are temporary, but... Now, when the temporary things will go away. Verse 10 tells us when these things cease. Do you see it there? When, there's your temporal word. When the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. What partial has he been talking about? Partial revelation, partial knowledge, partial prophecy. The disclosing of God's mind for the benefit of his people. The partial of that is going away when the perfect comes. Do you understand? Now we all know. That's the answer. Amen. Close in prayer. You're thinking, what's the perfect? That is where much of this debate centers. What is the perfect? There are some options. The perfect can refer to when the perfect comes means when the perfect comes to me. When I get perfect, when I'm glorified, when the believer goes to heaven. Or maybe the perfect is a reference to Christ. He's perfect. And when he comes, then these things will cease. 
Or maybe the perfect refers to the eternal state when perfect comes to everything everywhere. New heavens, new earth. Those options sound good and, and they have biblical warrant. To, I mean, all of those things are perfect. But are they the perfect that Paul is referring to? I, I fear we tend to hear a word like perfect and we go, I know what perfect is. And we run to another passage. We try to find out, okay, I'm going to find the word perfect and I'm going to drop it right here into this passage. Is that Paul's intent? Friends, that's, that's not how we study our Bibles. It, the the, the logical fallacy there is one of totality transfer. I see a piece of something over here. Hey, there's that same piece over there. I'm going to bring that whole thing, that's it, and drop it into this context. No, the, the best clue for what this piece means in this context is this context, this passage. Stay right in the passage. It's going to help us think about the perfect. And when you look up the word perfect, uh, in your Greek dictionary, in your English theological dictionaries, when you scan its use throughout the Bible, you're going to find that the word perfect means something like complete, mature, or end. It has a range of meanings. I'll give you one example in the book of James. Uh, James talks about um, trials working out their perfect result, making you, believer, in this life, under the trial, Perfect, same, same word twice. Now, when you encounter a trial, are you glorified right then? H has the trial worked out a, a glorification or return of Christ or new heavens, new earth result in your life? And are you therefore perfect? Well, no. What is James talking about there? Uh, the, James is talking about the trial having its intended end and what is the trial's intended end in the sovereign hand of a good God in your life? Your Christian maturity. Where do you get it? Um, when you endure various trials. Where do I get various trials? Whenever you encounter them. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I can count them joy. Right? That's James's point. Christian maturity in the Christian life, not glorification. Same word. The idea here for the word perfect is the Greek word telos. It, it is a contrast to the partial or the imperfect or the incomplete. It is the fullness or completion of that which has been up to that point incomplete or lacking. In this verse, the comparison is drawn. The context gives us the contrast between the partial and the perfect. We don't need to import the idea of perfect somewhere, somewhere else to counteract the partial in this text. You get an illustration in verse 11, an illustration from infancy to maturity. Right? And, and the illustration's obvious. Uh, when I was a kid, I acted like one. And then when I was a man, I put away those things. What is this illustration? Uh, what is this illustrating? Um, what's immature that becomes mature? What's in its infant stages that then grows up? I believe this illustration carries right along with the impartial, I mean, uh, with the partial to the fullness that Paul has already been talking about, which he is connected to knowledge and revelation, uh, the, the very words of God and he says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. I believe Paul is talking here about the church in its immaturity. And I don't mean, oh, you're so immature. I just mean, it was baby. It was first generation. The, the church was crawling. And like a mother cares for her toddler or her crawler, God loved the church, and he gave the church everything the church needed in its infancy. God wasn't giving to the first generation church the ribeye steaks that we feast on. That was baby food. And appropriately so, the, the, the revelation and regulation of God's word was not in place yet. But, but God gave a partial knowledge through words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miraculous sign gifts pointing to the authority of those who spoke the messages, Direct revelation. 
There's a second illustration in verse 12. This is an illustration from incomplete picture to full clarity. Look what Paul says. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will be fully known. Uh, then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. Uh, again, that now, <laughs> we tend to read that as, yeah, I'm reading it right now. It must be now. No, it's not now, now to us. This was now to Paul. It's then. Uh, and if we make the now, now, we're going to make then heaven. Have you read the verse this way? Hey, yeah. Now I see in a mirror dimly. Look, I... I I try to think about stuff, and it doesn't make sense to me. Seems pretty dim. But then, I'll know everything perfectly, and God's gonna, God know, is going to know me perfectly because I'll be in heaven. If we get the nows and the thens wrong, we, we think now is now and then is heaven. And that's not what Paul's talking about at all. Again, he's talking about knowledge and the present availability of knowledge as he's writing this to the Corinthians in 55 A.D. And you might think, oh, a mirror. I know where a mirror is. A mirror is over there in 2 Corinthians 3.18. This verse is used all the time to say, see, it's heaven. What does 2 Corinthians 3.18 say? We with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of Jesus are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. Uh, several problems with using 2 Corinthians 3.18 as a cross-reference. You see the word mirror? Again, totality transfer. I know what mirrors are. It's about heaven But then you even misunderstood 2 Corinthians 3.18, which is about our spiritual transformation here by faith in the revelation of Jesus Christ in his word. So you can't go to 2 Corinthians 3.18 to make this be heaven. What are you left with? Just an illustration. Um, We're accustomed to mirrors in our day. You, You get in front of the mirror, and it's a pretty good replication of your appearance, is it not? And you're thinking, no, it's terrible. I don't look like that. I'm not nearly that old. (laughs) Must be something wrong with the mirror. Where's the Windex? In the ancient world, a looking glass was a little less clear than they are today. It was a very expensive thing to have a clear representation of yourself in a reflection. Certainly was possible. They go back to the the third, uh, I lost track of it, third century, third millennia. BC, something like that. They're really old. We, we found mirrors in all kinds of ancient civilizations. But it's always better to get a, an assessment of someone with your own eyes face to face, person to person, rather than indirectly by reflection. Whatever is reflected has the potential to bring distortion. In fact, when you're looking in a mirror, you're not actually looking at what everybody else sees of you. It's backwards. Did you know that? It's reversed. And I know on our modern phones, you can take a picture of yourself, reverse the image, and then you go, ooh, who's that? That's all like crooked. But that's actually the reality. You've been looking at a false image every time you've looked in the mirror. And anytime there's a distortion, lighting or, or colors, whatever flaw exists in the glass affects your understanding of the reality, waves, cracks, dirt, smudges. And I can't see the back of my head. I, you know, I give myself a haircut with a razor, and I have to have other people check that I miss a spot. I can't see it, and I try to get two mirrors, and it never quite works out. They're blind spots. What's the point of all of that? We see, or we know, Paul says to the Corinthians, Dimly, it's distorted, not with the clarity that we will. What is Paul saying? There's a clarity coming that's a contrast to the dimness we're doing now. Literally, he says, we look through a mirror by an enigma. And look, if you've ever tried to fix your face or brush your hair in the reflection of a chrome bumper on a pickup truck, you understand the distortions. Man, it's just hard. It's inconvenient. I I gotta work extra hard to sort of get at this. And Paul says, clarity's coming. Listen, the church at Ephesus did not have any word of knowledge that was given at Corinth unless it was passed along or unless God gave the same word of knowledge to believers there at Ephesus. There's something fuller coming that God's church must have. Verse 13 gives us a final affirmation. Love lasts. But now faith, hope, love abide, these three. The greatest is love. So 
rising like the top peak of a a three peak mountain range of things that keep on going is this great magnificent mountain called love. What is Paul doing here for the Corinthians? You better figure out this love thing. The other things are going away, Corinthians. You better learn to love each other. This is a really important uh, thing to think about. At what point would the church need to hear this message? No matter where you put the perfect, no matter where you put the cessation, there has to be a time frame where sinners gathered together have to be commanded to love one another because gifts are going away. If you're a continuationist, and for you that's still in the future, you have to imagine some point in subsequent church history where the gifts actually do cease and the church has to learn to love each other. That's the command here. This obviously leads us to agree with the historical assessment, the experiential assessment, the definitional assessment that they did cease, that what we've seen in the 20th century are not the same things as the New Testament, and that love must abide. A final clue here in this verse, in verse 13. Notice what abides. Faith, hope, love. Faith, hope, love. Now, if if you've put the cessation at the perfect, meaning the return of Christ, or your entrance into heaven, or the new heavens and new earth, you're actually forcing verse 13 into heaven. Do you understand? You're forcing faith and hope into the eternal state. Friends, that that is not biblically where faith and hope belong. Faith gets replaced by what? Sight. And what does Paul say about hope? Listen to Romans 8. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Faith and hope belong to this age, and they are joined together with love, and faith and hope and love all outlast the revelatory sign gifts. Do you understand the argument? They have ceased, they must cease, they've wrapped up their purpose for existing as foundational to the church, they serve their purpose in God's good kindness to the church, but they don't serve a purpose in the ongoing ages of church history, but faith, hope, and love must. And love must reign in the church. There are a number of resources that you could read uh, on these things. Um, There are plenty of books out there that detail the the problems of the modern charismatic movement. Um, you'll, You'll find really good men who differ with what I just described who give a different definition of prophecy, a different definition of tongues, uh, and and try to leave room for God to still operate in these things. My encouragement to you, if if you want further investigation, um, you can reach out to me for any and all of those resources, Um, but but I I would hope that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 is a help as we think through these things. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your kindness in giving us your mind, your heart, and doing so in a book that that we can read, that we can memorize, uh, that we can study, that we can meditate on, so that we might know you, so that we might know your ways, so that our lives might come under the good regulation of your will. And we ask that you'd help us to do that, to to live up to the treasure that we have in your word by your grace, in Jesus' name, amen.